Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to another MLA Productivity and Profitability webinar. It's great to have you back for the 2021 webinar season and I hope you are all well, well rested um, and had a great Christmas and New Year. Uh, as I said, it's great to have you back to kick off into the new year. Um, my name is Hilary. I am the work for the webinar facilitators, Aggregate Consulting in Wagga Wagga, New South Wales. Tonight, we're going to delve into the Beef Benchmarking uh, 2019 and 20 review with Sandy McEachran from Aggregate, Aggregate Consulting. Just a bit of housekeeping to get started. Uh, this is the control panel that you should see on your screen. Uh, it might be in the top right hand corner. The red arrow button on the left collapses and reinstates the control panel. Uh, so you might wanna collapse that to get a better look at your screen this evening. You should be able to hear us, but we cannot hear you. So please type your questions in the box provided below uh, that I will relay to Sandy at the end of the webinar. Please make them as succinct as possible uh, and I will again get them to Sandy at the end of the webinar. So just to introduce uh, tonight's uh, presenter, Sandy McEachran is a Director and Consultant at Aggregate Consulting in Wagga Wagga. Aggregate manages a farm benchmarking database that records production and financial information of over 200 businesses from across South Eastern Australia. Aggregate provides a unique service that combines benchmarking data, farm economics and finance with the science of all production systems to help clients improve their profitability and to grow their farm business. So it's great to have Sandy with us this evening to take us through uh, the benchmarks of 2019-20. Uh, um, so I'll just make Sandy the presenter. You should see something pop up, Sandy. Got that. Thanks, Hillary. Yep, looks good. <clears throat> All right. I'll, well, welcome everyone and thank you, Hillary, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so as Hillary said, I will talk to the benchmarks from the 1920, but I, my intention was rather than just talk to the benchmarks, uh, I would actually look at um, some of the, you know, put them in context, I guess, and try and use them to think about uh, what's happening in the market now and what strategies people might employ going forward. And so we've obviously come out of a pretty severe drought, uh, particularly for some parts of the country and some parts of this database that I'm going to use. And cattle are in short supply, prices have gone through the roof. Um, at the same time, you know, land prices are, have escalated dramatically we've got low interest rates you know there's a whole host of factors going on within the market at the moment and i guess what i thought would be most useful for the audience today was rather than regurgitate a whole heap of benchmarks that i would try uh, and touch on what i consider some of the most important ones which are you know some of the bigger picture ones price cost of production the profits that are being made and what levels of production we're seeing um, and then look, use that information to do a bit of, you know, I guess uh, forward thinking and hopefully help people with their planning going forward. So that's the basically what I'll be trying to cover over the next 20 or so minutes. So just for those who've never heard us talk before, um, the data I'm using isn't, you know, it's not uh, uh, the equivalent of ABARE data, it's actually a skewed sample of the industry as any benchmarking database will be. Um, and it's collected from a pretty wide area, but essentially if you drew a line from Queensland in, you know, to Adelaide, uh, it's, it's to the south and east of the country. So while we collect a little bit of data in Queensland and a little bit in other states, predominantly it's gonna be southeast South Australia, the Eastern Seaboard, New South Wales, uh, Victoria, Tasmania. So that's where the data come from. In the 1920 data set, there was 116 beef enterprises that were benchmarked, uh, which is about 1.3 million DSE, uh, producing you know 26,000 tonnes of beef. So um, not a lot of producers really in context of the total number available, but 
again, being a skewed benchmarking database, it does tend to have larger operators in it. Although I would still argue we've got the full range. So we see very small operations through to very large ones as part of it. Um, so that's, that's where the data comes from. So bear that in mind, when I'm giving out benchmarks, really we're not talking about the equivalent of the average of the industry as a whole. We're talking really about the average or best performing enterprises amongst a skewed sample of producers that are really interested in the business performance of what they're doing. Um, they're keen to sort of, you know, optimise or maximise their profits out of the business and look at their businesses in, you know, with a long-term view. So just bear that in mind when I'm talking about some of the benchmarks here. <clears throat> so the graph I've got here shows uh, about 23 years of benchmark data, beef herd benchmark data and it's got the net profit per DSE, which is the left axis, uh, and the year of benchmarking from left to right. So in 2020, I'm talking about the 2019-20 year. So, and that includes people who have benchmarked a calendar year, 2019 calendar year, through to the 19-20 financial year. So some people benchmark different periods of time, um, but the commonality in each year is that they benchmark through the same spring, which is the key production period in the in the you know, data set we're looking at. So over that period of time, 23 years, the most notable thing I think from this graph is that if we look at 1998, which was 1997-98, 2003, which was 2002-2003, 2007-2008, six, seven, seven, eight, they had one thing in common, Besides the fact that the average profit from the database was negative, they were all severe drought years. Um, and histor historically, if you look at any beach, beef benchmarking data set, what we see <coughs> is that in the big drought years, people don't make money out of beef. Um, and that makes a bit of sense from the, from the fact that, you know, it's a, it's a weight gain exercise. And if you're in drought, there's not a lot of weight gain going on other than what you might buy in with supplementary feed. And historically, uh, you know, that's been a pretty low margin business, particularly for, you know, where we're trying to do it as amateurs, you know, not professional feedlots. So drought has historically meant that we've seen severe losses. So I think, you know, the most remarkable thing about the 2019 and 2020 years is that actually in context, as an average of the database, some reasonable healthy profits were made. And so um, it's not that it wasn't a widespread drought. It wasn't that they weren't severe drought years. They were both severe drought years, but there was something else going on there that allowed at least some of the database to scrape through having made some profit. Um, and particularly if you weren't particularly drought affected, then you're able to make decent profits. So, <clears throat> The background to what is going on there is really important, I think, because it contextualises what, what we're facing going forward. But just to show, you know, how where you were over those couple of years made a difference to what sort of profits you made. If we break up our benchmarking database into the central west region of New South Wales, the New England region of New South Wales, Riverina Murray, South East and Tablelands, and compare those areas to South Australia as a state, Tasmania as a state and Victoria as a state, you can basically see there what difference, how severe the drought was in any particular area made to those results. And so I think probably the New England were the, was the unluckiest area of the lot um, in that it, it was prolonged and it wasn't, it was right, you know, they were, at their worst, right at the end of that drought, when prices for stock were at their worst, uh, etc. So, it, you know, timing and where you were were important in this drought. And when I show those averages, it's not to say you should have made money in, the, even if you were drought affected. It's to say that um, the people who weren't were making really good profits, while the people who were were struggling just to come out with having made any profit. So, so that, 
that's you know the nature of the variation we get in the database. And with that in mind, I'm reluctant to talk too much about what the average cost of production was from the database in 19, 2019, 2020. Uh, I'm reluctant to talk about, you know, those that individual's years benchmarks um, in, in in any detail because there was such disparity in seasonal conditions within those within that period of time. So what I've tried to do is put some context around the numbers, um, and in this graph, I've got price received, which is dollars per kilogram of beef sold. Uh, and cost of production, which is dollars per kilogram of beef produced. So we calculate these KPIs, you know, slightly differently when we're doing our benchmarking in that when we're looking at production, we look at not only what you produce and sell, but we look at what you produce and retain. And also we take account of production that came from your starting inventory. So if you had a thousand head on and at the start of the year and 500 head on hand at the end of the year, then 500 head of your sales would be duck, deducted from your production because it was deemed to be a loss in inventory. So when we're looking at cost of production, we look at on a, on a kilos of beef produced basis. When we look at price received, because we're interested in you know, market comparisons, we look at kilograms of beef sold only. We don't look at kilograms of beef produced because that would be then at our standard inventory valuations. And we're looking for you know what drives variations in price received. And predominantly the main variation in price received is either the timing of the sale or the class of animals you, you are selling. So if you're selling a lot of young, say wiener cattle at a premium, uh, as a percentage of your total sales, then that would boost your average up significantly, uh, as opposed to if you're liquidating a cow herd and you're selling a lot of, you know, old cows or cows for restocking or cows just for slaughter in, in the, over the course of the year, then that might lower your average. They're the predominant drivers of variation in price received between producers. Um, there are other obvious, obvious variations um, caused by different things, but the other things tend not to have a big impact on very, you know, price received between producers. So again, this, this uh, graph maps out those two KPIs over the 23 years available. Um, and we see that price received per kilo sold has increased from a dollar to $3 over that period of time, remembering that the latest sale in this data set could have happened in uh, you know, July, June 2020. So, um, you know, we hadn't seen probably the price rises to the extent that we've seen. And realistically, the majority of sales in that year would have occurred in the spring of 2019, where the market was nearly at its lowest. So uh, that last year at $3, um, we know now since that, that market has moved, Significantly, I would think that the 19 or the 20, 2020, 21 data will see a, a price average closer to $4 per kilo, but given where markets have got to. So an, another significant lift up from where we'd been for the last three or four years, uh, even through that drought period. And then the red line is cost of production. And we've seen cost of production climb from you know, roughly on average about $1.25 up to, uh, in the 1920 years, you know, $2.75 on average. But again, in that $2.75, you've got a lot of drought, seriously drought affected production in there, a lot of supplementary feed or a lot of liquidation of a herd, which lowers your, you know, production basically. So you've got the same cost structure spread over a lot less production. Both of those things inflate cost of production. Uh, and therefore, I think the last two years are really, as an average, if we look at the average of the whole data set, an inflated uh, cost of average cost of production. And we're much more likely to see cost of production return to as an average of sub $2 in the 2020-21 year. The bit I've got circled is the bit that I think we should keep in mind at the moment, and that is prior to this drought, 
the margins in beef had got really wide by comparison to historical standards. So 2017, 16, 17 and 18 benchmark years, we were seeing margins never seen before in beef production. Unfortunately, we got a drought that came along that closed that margin right up for the average. Um, but we haven't seen prices retreat yet. Um, in fact, they're looking, you know, pretty good. So, um, so the reason I have circled that is, you know, it, it, I'm anticipating good those good margins, those above average margins by historical standards to return, you know, with the, with the easing of drought and as producers get back on track. So the price signals, given that, are really there to say, we want more production. If, 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 if we're gonna give you these margins, what we're chasing is significantly more production out of beef. And they haven't been able to get it in the short term, but I'm tipping that we'll get it in the longer term. <clears throat> at the same time, if I move on to production and I look at kilos of beef per hectare, now just a word of warning about this data is it's not always the same producers every year. Uh, there's a, a, some churn in who, get, who benchmarks and people coming in from different areas and leaving from different areas. So when I give you this data set or this data over time, I'm not necessarily giving you the exact same producers over that period of time. Um, and therefore, there's a chance that, you know, there's a substantial shift in the, the average level of rainfall per hectare, et cetera. Now, if you look at through the data, there's a little bit of a shift there, but not substantial. However, you know, just bear that in mind when you're looking at data. Since 2000 to 2020, we've seen beef production trending upwards. Um, and I think starting to follow the price signals that we're getting, and we've gone from 200 to 225 kilos of beef back there. So roughly, you know, a 10% increase in production. Now, over that such a long period of time, that's not particularly spectacular. Um, and I think we'd need to bear that in mind about why isn't, we haven't seen any spectacular increases in production over that period of time, even though prices have gone from $1 to $3. And what I would say to that is, is there's a lot, we reach a level where increased production can get very expensive. And despite the price signals, it may be hard to achieve increased production at a reasonable margin. And so I'll circle back to this point when we start talking about specifics, but if it were easy to find substantial increases in production, I think we'd have seen over 20 years more increase in production than we have. What this is telling me is we've got to be careful if we're going to chase increased production, we're talking about incremental changes, we're talking about finding those things that historically may not have paid but now do, we're unlikely to find something that's revolutionary in what we do. So if I go back to some specific targets for people, if, if I took out non better performing, not drought affected farms from 2019-20, these are the sorts of KPIs that I'd be looking at to emulate having a cost of production at around $1.55 per kilo. So remember just before I said, I think it'll return to less than $2 as an average. Well, I think the better performing farms will sit around $1.55 as an average, that top 20% as we classify them. So that would be what I'd want to emulate then because for every kilo of beef produced, I've got an extra 25 cents in margin between my cost of production and my price received. To do that, I'll probably I'd be producing around 50 kilos of beef per hectare per 100 mil, and I've also included 20 kilos of live weight of beef per DSE. The the per hectare per 100 mil figures um, are good for if you're within a certain rainfall range, you know, probably uh, above 500 mils. Uh, I'm not sure where the upper limit is to be honest, but you know, it's probably around 900 mils. So between 500 and 900, if you sit within that range, that that and also your land class, you know, is what I would call predominantly arable. 
uh, so you can fertilise it and grow a decent pasture there, then I think you'd use that KPI as a target, 50 kilos of live weight of beef per hectare per 100 mil. You can also use 20 kilos of live weight per DSC, which is again where we see the averages fall out amongst those better performing farms. Some people a little bit more, some people a little bit less but they might have a little bit more with a little bit higher cost of production or a little bit less with a little bit lower cost of production, but they all fall within, you know, that not far from that 20 kilos of live weight of beef per DSE. So they'd, they'd be my two production KPIs, cost of production of $1.55, 20 kilos of live weight of beef per DSE and 50 per hectare per 100 mils. There's some preconditions to achieving those and they are that, you are stocked near your long-term carrying capacity. So if you've come out of drought, you're substantially understocked, and I know a, you know a large number of people are or were, then it's probably unrealistic to think you're gonna get a cost of production of $1.55 per kilo when you can't spread your overheads or your labor, you know, particularly your labor, but you know, admin costs, vehicle costs, et cetera, over enough production. So you know that that's going to constrain you if you're still in that situation you need a pretty efficient production system and by that i mean pretty pretty efficient from a labor perspective um, 20,000 dscs per labor unit plus is really what we're talking and you need that production per hectare and within that you need adequate livestock performance you can't have poor performing stock in that system they do need to perform, they need to hit target markets in a reasonable amount of time. So they're the preconditions. If all that's in place, then you know I can't see why a dollar fifty-five cost of production and fifty kilos of live weight of beef per hectare, fifty kilos live weight of beef per hectare wouldn't be achievable. Um, you know, that's what I would be targeting. <clears throat> so what are the outcomes of these targets? And the out again. These outcomes are what that group of producers achieved in the 1920 year. And the, and the columns on the left are at $3.15 per kilo of live weight sold, which was the average price received for those producers over that uh, 1920 benchmark year. The light green is the gross margin, dollar per DSE figure. And the dark green is the net profit per DSE figure. So. The two columns on the left, the light green one and the dark green one are the gross margin per DSE and gross margins calculated as your, your, your income, less direct costs. So supplementary feed, animal health, selling costs, any you know, labor contract services or something that can be directly attributed to the beef herd. And your net profit is after overhead costs, which includes your admin depreciation on plant equipment, which isn't usually big for livestock and labor, which is typically the big one. So that's either wages paid or owner labor in that. It doesn't include any finance costs, interest, et cetera. So we're, we're looking at last year, that group of producers doing about $35 per DSE net profit, as we call it. And then on the right, I've added in what I think would be the net profit, what sort of net profits we're looking at in the 2021 year, even though we haven't got the benchmarking in yet, but what I've done is adjusted that price up to $4 per kilo live weight sold. And using 20 kilos of beef per DSE as my assumption, then we're shifting profits up about $17 per DSE. And so all of a sudden we're looking at profits of $50 per DSE within that group. And we're looking at profits, you know, probably never, never seen before. So um, that's, that's my sort of, guess at where the benchmarking will fall out in the 2021 year, given the prices we've seen recently. Again, it will be only for those people who are lucky enough or have you know, got their circumstance back to the point where they are at full production. What issues are we facing in order to maximise beef profits in the short to medium term? Well, obviously for those drought affected producers, it's restocking and getting back to full production as quickly as possible. Um, for those that are already there, lucky enough because the drought wasn't as severe or, you know, have reinvested financially to end up in that position, um, then it's now about 
can we increase production to maximise profits further? So given we've got these huge margins, while prices are as high as they are, what can we do to maximise profits? And also, you know, should we or can we still expand the business um, and you know, buy another farm, etc.? cetera? So they're the, I think they're the key issues that are falling out of the circumstance we're in. So I don't think cattle have got too expensive yet if you're considering restocking. Um, and, I, and I say that with respect to the consideration of the margin for error. So I've just pulled together some numbers to highlight what I'm thinking. So I'm, I'm saying if I go out and buy a PTIC cow one month out from calving and I'm looking at her return over a 12 month period. So her average annual DSE rating for that is just short of 15, but I've called a 15 for the sake of the exercise. I go out and pay $2,475 for that cow, which is $165 for DSE, you know, way more than we're used to. Um, but if I go back and consider what gross margins I'm likely to get at, you know, four dollars a kilo, then I'm looking at a seventy dollar a DSE gross margin, which on fifteen DSE would be making a thousand dollars of income. So what I'm saying is that two and a half thousand dollar cow and car, uh, pregnant cow twelve months later, so with a calf that is you know, eleven months old, I'm saying the the sum of that would be worth a bit over three and a half thousand you know, less costs. So, you know, I'm saying that in today's market, that's not unrealistic and would give you a, a you know, simple return on investment of around 40%. And that's just dividing the gross margin by the price paid for the cow. However, what we're afraid of is that we're going to incur a capital loss in that cow. And so, you know, we buy it at 2,475, the market shifts, the value of the cow at the end falls, Calves aren't worth as much. And so I've pulled the, looked at what sort of capital loss I could incur before my adjusted return on investment would fall to 10%. And so that's about $800 for that PTIC cow. So we'd be talking about taking PTIC cows from $2,500 back to um, $1,600. The adjusted gross margin allowing for that capital loss is $250, which is a 10% ROI. At that, I'm starting to get nervous about making investment in livestock, um, but I've, I've allowed for an $800 fall in the capital value. Roughly, that would be, we'd still be making $48 a DSE gross margins in the beef herd. So down a bit from where we are, but not you know down back to where we were 10 years ago. So, you know, my thinking is there's plenty of room for it to fall away whilst if it did fall that far, I wouldn't make any money necessarily or not a lot of money. Um, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have lost any money. And if it doesn't fall that far, then I capture any upside in between. And so I'm still thinking there's, there's uh, the market hasn't got too hot yet. Um, and that at the, at the prices we're paying, we've got room for it to fall. Yes, if it does, we won't have made any money and that would be a shame. But if it doesn't and I haven't bought, I won't have made any money. And so, you know, my thinking is invest, take the risk, get back as quickly as possible to where I should be. So, so restocking, I think, still on the cards if we're down or even the lifting stock numbers, by the way. So if we're wanting to uh, lift stocking rate you know, by 5%, then I think we can afford to buy the stock to do it. I looked at then at what, at what lift in costs could I incur uh, and what commensurate lift in production I would need to at least break even. So um, if I lifted, costs by 5%, so that is the column on the left, the percentage increase in costs, I've got 105%, 110%, 115%, 120%. So that's of the cost structure that's there now. So it's a 5%, 10%, 15%, 20% increase in costs. And I've mapped that out against some different prices. So I lift costs by 5%, but price falls down to $2.70 or increases up to $4. What 
increase in production do I need as my minimum to break even? I wouldn't make any less profit per hectare. And really across all of that, we're talking about, you know, if I lift uh, cost by 5%, I'm looking at a two to 3% lift in production to cover that. If I lift it by 15%, I'm looking at about a six to 8% lift in production at a range of prices to cover that. If I can get that or more, I will come out ahead. I will make more profit per hectare. 115% of the cost base is actually doubling what I've called the feed, uh, the, the feed costs in the business. And that is fertilizer, chemical, supplementary feed. Um, so where under normal circumstances, normal seasonal conditions, average or, or better, not under drought affected circumstances, if I double those costs, that's 115%, I'd need six to eight percent lift in production to cover that. It doesn't seem like a lot, but when I go reflect on that graph I showed earlier, which is up in the top right corner now, you know, and reflect that the industry's only achieved the 10% over 20 years, it makes me think I've got to be careful. You know, what, where am I going to lift costs and what sort of production am I going to target? So I think we're still back at some of the first principles of, you know, grazing businesses where we're looking to eat more of the weeds you grow. So if there's things I can do to increase the pasture utilisation that I've got, so, you know, if I'm currently using 40%, is there things I could do to make it lift that to 50%? And that might be, I'm going to supplementary feed key areas, or I'm going to add, um, you know, things like gibberellic acid in at critical times. So, you know, what, are, what room have I got to eat more of the pasture I grow? Can I grow more of that pasture? And I've called it weeds, just to, just to make sure that we don't confuse this with changing species where you've got to take that country out of production and I'm not saying you can't make a return out of that but it's a longer process it's a lot more expensive process and it typically has a higher a lower rate of return on it so I really I'm hit with the grow more weeds I'm talking about fertilizer uh, lime and then eating those so we're, I think and this seems to be plenty of room in the industry when you look around farms to find spots where you could improve utilisation of what you grow or you could actually grow more in those spots just by addressing soil nutrient issues um, in particular, but maybe fencing, you know, for subdivision, etc. So right now, they'd be the things I'd be trying to pick off and I'd be trying to invest heavily on farm in those areas. And the other one is to rethink all those things that you thought were marginal in the past with regards to particularly herd health. So subclinical losses, say from trace elements, um, some, some losses in production where, you know, we couldn't afford to supplementary feed for that month where we were a bit short and previously, perhaps now we can. So go back through your list of things that you've tried in the past, they were marginal because the margins in what you were doing were lower and try and pick off a few of them where you can say now with a higher margin, a much better price, perhaps they're back in play. So those animal health issues, the um, pasture quality or quantity issues, the short term ones that we can really throw a lot at um, would be you know, really useful. Uh, nitrogen, I think in pastures, you know, typically we went back 15 years, we wouldn't use a lot of it, but now you know, we can afford to use a fair bit of it. So, pick up those production losses if we, or opportunities if we can. Um, expanding the enterprise, at this point and at these prices, I don't think beef has a competitive advantage that would justify an enterprise switch just for the sake of switching enterprises. So the graph in the top right corner there is, you know, the, the best performing prime lamb, dual purpose, which is basically terminal size over Merino use wool enterprises, self-replacing wool enterprises and beef herds. Now remember that was at a beef price of $3.15, but beef amongst the top performing, so not drought affected producers, still lagged the sheep enterprises in the 1920 year. Um, and yes, beef's had a big kick up, but then so have some of the prime lamb and wool prices kicked up since then as well. So 
I can't see, or I'm not anticipating that there'll be a substantial advantage from being a beef producer financially compared to other enterprises. So I wouldn't be switching for the sake of it. Um, I'd want a pretty good reason to switch enterprises into beef production. So I don't think that's where the extra production is going to come from substantially. The land values and the expansion. So again, I've just mapped out for buy land, it's from 700 to $1,000 a DSE. What's my, and my marginal profit per DSE varies from $20 to $40. What sort of return on investment have I got? And this includes uh, some additional cost on purchase, like stamp duty, et cetera, um, in that calculation. And it includes, you have to buy the stock, livestock at $165 a DSE. So I've added $165 to each land value. And so the red is all those returns that are below 2.5%. And I've said that's you know a target cost of capital, um, as in you know what debt would cost you to buy it. And so, uh, you know, we're at a point already where we've got to make these good profits to be above the cost of capital. We can still do it, even at $1,000 a DSE, if prices stick around long enough, uh, then we'll be above our cost of capital. But two things can change, and that is the prices gradually come back or uh, our cost of capital goes up and now, both of those things might occur and both of them might occur together. Together, So I believe looking at this and given those returns at the $1,000 a DSE point and given the number of farms that I think are now selling at prices towards that, that we're probably reaching a point where capital gains may not be predominant uh, drivers of the decision going forward. And I say that by with reference to the fact that if we start paying $1,000 plus a DSE, our return, even if we're going really well, even if we're flying, is only two or 3%. We're not paying down a lot of debt out of that. And so we're stuck with that debt for a while. Um, then if interest rates start moving upwards, and I'm not saying they will soon, but you know, maybe in four or five years they do, or profits start to get eroded, because of increased production, more pressure on price, um, or increased costs going in, then our returns are going to be constrained at those levels for a while. And so I'm starting to think that the capital gains may not be a dominant driver. So just to wrap this up, key messages. <coughs> um, the margins we're seeing and expect to see now that hopefully seasonal conditions have returned to average or better, should be encouraging us to take some additional production risks, do things that we thought were too marginal to do in the past, increase our production per hectare. I still think it's prudent to concentrate on the low cost ones. So pasture utilisation, increasing pasture production from fertiliser and lime. I think they're the most important. Focus on them and I think there's still plenty of opportunity in those. I don't think enterprise switching makes sense. I don't think we're going to see a significant increase in production from that at these prices. Um, but if it makes sense from a point of view that there's productivity gains to be made, i.e. better labour efficiency, um, you can concentrate on one enterprise and just do it better, et cetera, then you, know, you still might. Um, and then as far as expansion goes, I think we're reaching a level pretty quickly now where future capital gains are a risk and that makes the investment in land a less attractive investment. Uh, perhaps, we, you know, it won't be too far down the track. I think we'll be looking at it and saying, let's wait. Unless there's a good strategic reason, oh, it's next door, et cetera, or we need to scale and that'll give us some productivity advantages. It, let's just wait because it might be five or 10 years before the land prices go again. So that's where I think we're at from beef. Courtney, uh, Hillary, if we've got any questions. Uh, yes, uh, thanks very much for that, Sandy. Um, so yeah, as Sandy said, uh, if anyone has any questions, just send them through now. I'm sure there'll be a few um, come through in a second, just before we get to them. Uh, if you do have to leave early, you'll be um, presented with a survey as you exit the webinar. If you could take two to three minutes to complete this survey, it just provides feedback to MLA, uh, Asset Aggregate Consulting and the webinar presenters to make sure that the 
um, topics and their presentations are relevant to you as producers. Okay, Sandy, if you're right to go, I've got a few questions um, that have come through. Uh, the first one, what do you call a beef enterprise? Uh, are they breeders only? Uh, not necessarily breeders only, but yes, predominantly. So they're self-replacing beef herds, um, or not even necessarily self-replacing, but they are breeding. Um, we have another category which we call trade cattle as a separate enterprise. Um, and, you know, there are a few trade cattle that end up in beef herds, but not a lot, to be honest. Most of it is self-replacing uh, beef herds and some who aren't self-replacing, but still breeding, yes. And just on that, the next question asks, um, does the 20 kilos of live weight per DC vary from breeders to traders or will it cover both? No, uh, the, sorry, that only covers breeding, doesn't cover trading. Um, it'll be much higher in trading because you don't have that maintenance component in the in the herd, which is the breeding cow for you know a period of the year. Um, so trading herds or will do more production per hectare than breeding herds. Excellent. And um, for those who are asking about the webinar recordings, yes, they are recorded and they are available on the MLA website uh, either tomorrow or Friday. They will be up. Uh, this one will be up. Um, if you just Google MLA profitability, uh, pro production and profitability webinar series, you should be taken straight to the page. Uh, so the next question from Chris, um, Nave, who also said a great presentation. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, he asked, you mentioned econ economies of scale in your summary. What does your benchmarking show in terms of economies of scale, both total head but also labour unit per head, if you can answer that? Yeah, the, look, the main economies of scale are found in labour efficiency. Uh, beef's, that's one of beef's real strong points, competitive advantages, I think, is that in the last 15 years, we've seen uh, production or, or uh, labour use efficiency, DSEs per labour unit run, increase dramatically from 10,000 DSEs per labour unit to now we've got producers, you know, consistently doing close to 30,000 DSEs per labour unit. So what we've worked out is that we can run large herds with not a lot of labour. Um, and labour being the single biggest cost in grazing businesses, that's a substantial advantage. It does require a production system that allows you to. So, you know, some production systems are more labour intensive than others, and therefore they're never going to achieve that. Um, so where you've got a system that, you know, you, you, particularly if you're looking for out of season production, and that means you're looking for production outside the, really the spring period or a lot of production outside the spring period, they tend to be more intensive from a labour point of view. You tend not to see the labour efficiencies that we get in other systems, particularly those at spring calving tar targeting the feedlots. Great, thank you for the question. Uh, the next one, thanks Sandy. Why do you feel that land values in uh, land value increases may ease? I, I think what we're going to see is that and I'm not saying we're there yet, I'm not saying we're at the end of it yet, but I, th I think what we're seeing is if our yield off land done well is only two or three percent, and if it's, even though it's not below our cost of capital necessarily now, you know, if history's any guide, it will be one day in the future, then um, at that value, at the value it is now, in five years' time, if interest rates have climbed back up to say 5%, then at that value, it's harder to buy land and pay for it. Like we're in a pretty unique period, or we've just come through a pretty unique period where the more land you buy, the higher your interest cover, you know, because our cost of capital is so low, in some cases under 2%. So we can yield, we'll be able to yield three or 4%, pay, pay an interest rate of 2% and it's, you know, that's an extraordinary thing historically. We're also at a level where beef production, the beef prices that are around, even if they come back from where they are today, they're still at a level that will encourage more production um, because it's the margins are so good. And I think, you know, the, the great consultant from WA, Bob Hall, once said, nothing cures high prices like more high prices. 
because we get more production. And I, you know, I think that's, we can expect that, that we can't expect prices to keep climbing in, you know, as quickly as they have in the last five years. At some stage, they'll plateau out because they're high enough already to encourage more production. And, I, and that's where I think we are. Great. Thank you for the question. Glad to see there's plenty of good consultants coming out of WA. Uh, the next one, uh, Sandy, was the $165, uh, I think, per DC stock allowance included in the cost of expansion per DC? Yeah, yes, it was. I added that to the – so where I said – you purchase land at $700 or $1,000 a DSE, I added $165 a DSE for the livestock in that equation. Thank you. Plus, plus four four and a half percent stamp duty, just as a round figure in, that, in the land acquisition components. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, the next question, there's two here, I'll just try and wrap into one. Um, where can you access definitions for the performance measures? Could you find them on the MLA website if you know? Um, and if you're not currently using the performance me measures within a beef enterprise, where would you suggest to begin? So our, the definitions we use in our benchmark database, so this is, the data's all come from our own data benchmarking database. Um, they used to be published pretty widely in our Ag Insights, but we've stopped uh, producing that. So uh, they're in the appendices of those. So happily would share them or happily um, post them with this webinar um, to MLA, what those definitions are. So that would be, I could, I'll provide them, but that's where they'll come from and they'll come from us. Great, thank you. And if you're not currently using performance measures, would you suggest to begin with that benchmarking process? I think the benchmarking process, particularly in benchmarking groups, is the single most valuable thing we do. Um, I think that's where our clients get the most value out of anything we do, because you're in a like-minded peer group and you're talking, you're you know, getting everything out on the table in a standard format and then talking about what what's changing and what's happening and motivating each other to improve. So I would definitely recommend it. I think you know, participating in benchmarking, uh, if you're really interested in driving your business forward, would be a major boost and you'd never regret the small amount of money you'd pay. Great. Thank you for the questions. Uh, the next one's quite interesting. What influence on land values could be attributed to land banking or development? So, uh, for example, value disconnected from production. To this point, I don't think any. I think the primary driver to this point has been interest rates. Uh, interest rates, very low interest rates at a time when commodity prices are really good. Like I seriously think we're gonna look back at this period of time as a commodity boom and the profits that we made and, and really look back and think, wow, remember that, you know, um, because, you know, leading up into this sort of from 2012 to now probably, leading up into that, the 90s and 2000s, we weren't going anywhere near this in terms of profit. Um, and that went on for a long period of time and so, you know, history says we've probably got another, we're commodity producers, we've probably got another tough period coming. So I don't think it's disconnected at all yet. Um, but while interest rates stay as low as they are, I think it will get disconnected. I think above $1,000 a DSE, we're starting to run that risk. Um, unless someone can see continued increase in commodity prices from here. And most people I speak to are really fearing a fall in commodity prices. They're not hoping it'll keep going up. So um, nothing yet, not land banking yet, but from here on, perhaps. Great, thank you. Uh, so Sandy, the next question, do you forecast that breeding cows will continue to get higher in price? <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I think, I mean, I'm, gee, I don't know much about the future, but, um, my feeling is probably not. I think we're, we're probably, at, in terms of chasing restock of demand, we're probably through the worst of it. You know, the crisis in terms of total lack of restockers available. Um, I suspect every heifer in Australia has been joined for, for this calving coming. Um, so, 
you know, I, I suspect we're probably worse through the worst of it. No, I, I, I'm guessing we won't see dramatic lifts in uh, cow prices from this point forward. Great. Thank you. Um, Sandy, next question. Do you have any comments on the recently re released Farm Monitor Victoria figures? Uh, I haven't seen them, so no. But I will go and look now that I know yeah. they've been released. Um, the next question um, from Chris. I noted from one of your earlier slides that you don't have any benchmarking enterprises in the Gippsland and South East Victoria. A related question, is there any annual rainfall level that sees the greatest return on investment, understanding that property prices are linked to rainfall? Uh, no, we don't see that. So we don't see variation driven by regions, by area. We don't, I haven't found an area that's more profitable than another from a perspective of, you know, profit made per hectare relative to rainfall. Um, how you do it can be very different in different areas. And uh, we, whilst there's known in that 1920 year, we have had benchmarking data come out of the Gippsland or Southeast Victoria region. Um, and again, in, if you're in any Eastern Fall, so uh, Monero, uh, Gippsland, New England, anything that's sort of Eastern Fall or, or close to the close, get, got those east, easterly low influences, where you might have a good rainfall, but it's very variable. So your average is made up of those 200 mil dumps every now and again. Um, then you've got to be careful of using per hectare per 100 mil benchmarks, even if you've got good rainfall. So I should have probably mentioned that, but you know that has proven to be the case over the past. Great. That seems to be the end of the questions for this evening. Um, lots of thank yous coming through, Sandy. So um, I'll just back that up with saying thanks very much for presenting this evening. It was definitely um, one of the best webinars I think we've had in this series so far. So thank you for spending the time on that. Um, thank you for everyone for participating. Um, we'll be back again in a fortnight um, and I have to back that up with the Prime Lamb enterprise data so I look forward to that uh, in a fortnight's time so uh, thanks again Sandy and thanks to everyone for participating. Pleasure.